We have two guests who are joining us in the studio. Zach Olo is a former rugby player and he's also an author. And Agri Tabeda is the managing director of Sports Options Limited, also a rugby aficionado. <laughs> Shall we call you that? Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Good Thank to you. have you in Kenya's biggest conversation this morning. Karibu Nisan. And they've come with a big book, City. Hmm? A book first, this book. All right. Yeah. But uh, this book, if you haven't gone to the gym, you'll have problems carrying it. <laughs> It's 100 years heavy. <laughs> <laughs> a Century of Pride by Zach Olo. Mm -hmm. Very, very nice book. You know, it's, uh, it's, co it's called what, a coffee table top, a coffee table a coffee table table book. book. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so, see, we see Edna Weke, 100 years of rugby in Kenya, the origins, development, and history of the game in the East African Territory and Kenya in particular is documented in snippets in a variety of publications and it remains largely unavailable to the rugby enthusiast and the Kenyan sportsman or historian. However, this book now brings all those together and that's the work that Zach has done. Welcome and thank you very much for uh, coming and bringing me this book, Zach. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, you will note that the hundred is a small plus. Mm. A hundred plus, yes. Mm. Yes, it's a hundred plus, yes. It's more than a hundred. Mm. So it's not just from 1923. Mm -mm. It goes beyond that, mm -hmm. from the protectorate and all. Yep. Mm. Okay, let's first of all know who Zakolo is. I am first and foremost a rugby player and a rugby administrator. That's what I've done most of my life. In my spare time, I've actually been in financial services. I was in insurance. In your spare time. <laughs> <In your> spare <laughs> time. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I hope my past employers don't hear this. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, so I'm uh, uh, following upon my rugby heritage. Mm. I decided I would write a book on it. I am uh, uh, married with a uh, I had two kids, uh, mm. lost one. Mm -hmm. So uh, now I'm basically a retired financial services executive. Okay. Yeah. And you spend a lot of your time now doing what? I spend a lot of my time now researching. Uh, this is not the, the, the only book I've done. Mm. I've, done uh, other I've done another book on, on a different topic. And I'm researching other topics. Mm. So I'm more or less morphing into a writer. You have already morphed into one. So you're mm -hmm. not morphing. You're not morphing. Yes, you already ate. <laughs> you're, a, you're a completely morphed individual. Yeah, yes. full butterfly. Yes. With <laughs> beautiful uh, wings. Agri, you are known by many who have seen you, but maybe others have not seen you. So who's Agri to bed? Uh, thank you for having me. Um, a sports consultant. I uh, have been many things. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm an electrical engineer by training. I, for many years, I was an electrical contractor, um, but again, uh, on my um, spare time, I would say, which morphed into almost full time, again, yeah. I was a rugby administrator for a very long time. Yeah. Uh, been an administrator at Kenya Rugby, we've uh, been able to run various tournaments in the past, Safari Sevens, Rugby Super Series, uh, later on as I... I tried to move away. I, I ran into Supersport, who are the ones who converted me now into a full-time sports consultant. I mm. did a lot of work with Supersport for several years. Mm. Um, then now we are we are retired. Um, past chairman of uh, the Rugby Patron Society, which is uh, basically people who've gone out to pasture and are trying to put something back into the game. Yes. What is some, what is putting something back into the game? Um, the, 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 the Rugby Patron Society is, uh, is an interesting body. It was actually formed in 1953 and then it, uh, it re-engineered itself in 1967. And um, some of the things they've done in the past is, uh, for example, they are the ones who uh, started the Safari Sevens mm. and ran it uh, and funded it while it could not make any money and uh, from 1996. And then it started making money around, I think, uh, 2001, two, um, and by 2006, uh, it was handed over to Kenya Rugby to run it. Um, the, the organization then moved on and uh, it, uh, uh, it funded the, the, the borehole at uh, the RFUF water to be able to make sure that the pitch uh, is in playable condition. 
it also was behind the the big stand that's on the Ngong Road side uh, that was put up. Um, and then after that, um, we, we we went into rugby uh, grassroots development. Um, we decided to focus on what you might call the disadvantaged areas uh, because we felt there was already a lot of uh, programs like that in schools and other areas. So within Nairobi, we have four centers. Uh, one in Gidogoro, Gidogoro is on Runda. We have three other centers, one in Matasia, one in Bulbul, and one in Kibiko. Mm. Yeah, and uh, that's what we've been doing. Yeah. Yes. Looking at the progression of sports uh, generally in the country, and then looking at 100 years of rugby um, in Kenya, perhaps previously it was seen as something that you do if you were able bodied. And then looking at now what you were able to do, what has been done with young people taking sports to the grassroots, taking rugby to the grassroots. We looked at the progression of sport and it became, you know, from something that you did over the weekend or something that you did after school to something that then became a career for many, many young men and women um, in Kenya. It became really something to be sought after. How has, how have you seen that progression um, from something that was maybe just seen as extracurricular or co-curricular? and then really became something that people could invest their lives in. Well, I think the irony is that um, that progression has not been across the board. Mm. That in one, in one respect, the game outside schools has progressed very well into professional, uh, from just kicking about into a professional game. Mm -mm. But when it comes to schools, you see that the progression has been in reverse. That, um, and this is something that uh, City Muga and I had a, a laugh about the other day mm. that we went to schools where you went to school in the morning and in the afternoon it was games yes. every day. Yep. So we only had five or six hours of classwork. But today you find that most of the same schools, people go, they, they're going to class up to 6 p.m. So that progression has been in reverse. And I'm not too sure that that's a, that's a good thing. Mm. So are we saying then that for the folks who've been able to professionalize it for themselves then the aspect of education then has uh, has not been paid attention to uh -huh. or that rugby in rugby being practiced in school is not being given the adequate attention that it must if folks will then professionalize it later i think the latter is the case okay that if if it was given suffi sufficient um attention then you would have a better outcome mm. at the end of the pipeline mm. and that the professional ones would be the professional players would be a lot better and, and benefit uh, more from it uh, particularly because uh, rugby i suspect unlike most other sport the younger you get into it the better the outcomes mm. yeah mm. yeah um i'd agree with him i think um if let's just uh, mention CBC, which has been uh, being by, uh, is, 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 is what is going to take the, 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 the country's education system forward. Mm. I've gone through it. I just, I just don't see the word sport anywhere, anywhere. anywhere. Mm. Yeah. And that just tells you that uh, going forward, mm. um, sport is something that uh, people will do either because they want to do it themselves or they have to wait until they finish school. I hear what you're saying. Yeah. So, uh, so, are we doing enough? I mean, I, I, I think about myself. I went to a school where the same thing happened. Yeah. That you were in school during the morning and early afternoon, but there was every day plus the weekend whereby you were actively engaged in sports. And I'm not just talking about kicking a ball around. I'm talking about like actively, actively engaged in sports because there were other things that were taught. There was discipline that was taught. There was management that was taught. There was so many other things that was taught, that were taught. So do you think that there needs to be focus on this co, and I'm not even call it extra, this co-curricular discipline, sport being one of them, in the current education system in the country? Yeah, I think it, it, it's, it's not just focus. It has to be embedded mm. into the curriculum. So that uh, it's then budgeted for, then the whole system and the school um, makes sure that sport will be part of uh, 
the the education of mm. of, of of the young people um i have been to one or two schools and uh what i have seen is uh, spaces that were previously allocated to to grounds mm. are being converted into more concrete and uh, more classrooms mm. and uh, yeah so so and, and that just tells you that it's not important mm. um i i have a niece who recently finished uh, uh form four and uh, i was surprised one time because i was trying to push her to do sports when i went to the school and it's in nairobi here in a in an affluent neighborhood mm. i discovered that sports was not compulsory it's mm. up to the it's up to the kids themselves to decide what to do but mm. the, the school is not focused at all on the sport it's not pushing it yeah mm. see where the error mm. in my mind comes in now i'm speaking as somebody who was an educator for a long time is that sports is considered an extracurricular co-curricular yeah. when you're in the sports field it's a classroom it is if you happen to be in a school or an institution where there's a swimming facility it's a classroom yeah people look at it in terms of exercise and what it does physiologically but the physiological has a direct relationship to the psychological. I agree. In, indeed, the, the, the national, the, the, the contribution of sport to the national well-being yes. is immense. Yes. I mean, look at Argentina today. Yes. The citizens of Argentina today have forgotten about their inflation <laughs> for the time being. I don't think they've recovered yet. No. Football, whatever. No, so the, the contribution is immense. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I was also talking the other day to somebody who gave me a statistic which I didn't know that uh, the biggest export of Portugal is football mm. yeah and uh, when you think about it starting with ronaldo and others mm. yeah the amount of mm. uh, money that eventually comes flows back into portugal because of the the the, the, the players who mm. are now out there um and therefore if you want to focus on sport for example kenya as a country it can become a very very big business opportunity mm. uh we we have that pedigree in terms of potential and we see the the stars but i think we've not been able to harness that into a a, a business mm. that 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 can come and begin to to rival other sectors you know there's one sector income. in the you know, on this planet it's called the financial sector the act has a wonderful litmus test for what is valuable look at what professional sports people are paid it tells you mm. it's understood very true so then i mean obviously those are things that we can look at for sure but then here we are and we're laying a case and saying look, it's absolutely necessary look at just the, the the sport of rugby and what it has done in kenya zakolo playing um you playing as well looking at the progression i mean i think of people who played the sport i think of them and, and coached the sport i think of the munyafu brothers i think of uh more recently people like humphrey um and collins and jera osco seer how then did sports change rugby change their lives for us to be able to lay a case and say actually you know what this is something that we can actually do <laughs> let's let's start with um perhaps the best example is eddie rombo uh, Eddie, Eddie went to the University of Nairobi and uh, uh, took commerce and played wonderful rugby. He's probably the greatest player we've ever had. And, uh, and after, after playing in Singapore in 1990, he was then picked, uh, he was scouted and he was picked to go and go for trials in the, in the UK. Mm -hmm. He went for trials, successful, and he played professional league rugby mm -hmm. for the next decade or so and in the process he also went back to school studied law so not only did he get up to improve his education but also he did fairly well in terms of returns on his professional rugby and he came back set up a law firm fairly successful one and he is a shining example of what rugby can do for someone now when we go on to Humphrey Kayange mm. you see the same same sort of thing mm -hmm. and Humphrey takes it further mm -hmm. by 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 moving on from from just playing yeah. on to uh international uh sports uh leadership yeah. as a member of the IOC yes. committee and and that's what rugby can do mm -hmm. yeah it's a big thing let's look at the history if I just take you back into um the 100 plus years of rugby history in the country how did rugby begin in this territory well, it uh, it came by ship, like the English language. Literally, literally. <laughs> landed, landed in Mombasa, uh -huh. where it was played. 
not by locals, but it was played by the uh, the incoming the incoming uh, lot. So mm -hmm. you had administrators and you had private sector. Mm -hmm. They played rugby in Mombasa. When it, whenever the as, as as the railway moved, rugby moved with it, mm -hmm. and pretty soon you had rugby all the way up to Eldred by about um, the the 30s, the early 30s, mm. rugby had reached Eldred, which was an interesting occurrence because the rugby that reached Eldred came from South Africa. Yeah. When uh -huh. the Boers migrated mm -hmm. and went to. And, and you'll find in that book there's a very interesting little chapter mm. on the so-called Kitale connection mm. because all the Boers went there. And so all of a sudden there was a, 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 a springing up of rugby playing Kenyans mm. at the very soon after independence and these were led by the South African Boers who were who were there so you had uh, for example the Kenya team in 1980 the first national Kenya team had five people from Kitale which was weird mm. <laughs> yeah so anyhow the game was then played in uh, the so-called high-cost Muzungu schools yeah it was played in prep schools mm. and until about uh, the 1990s when i was uh, now at the union when i was secretary of the union for for six years mm. from 70 uh, 91 to 97 there was a very strange occurrence at the union that there was a group of people from uh, kenyatta university mm. ex black blood play mm. and uh, they called themselves uh, what they call themselves <laughs> Dambupevu, mm -hmm. he was one of them. Mm -hmm. And Dambupevu at the end of the 80s had this brilliant idea that, look, we are teachers. We are going to be posted to various schools in the, in the country. Mm. Let us spread rugby. And they came to the union and talked to the union and they received the union support. And that's when rugby really spread out. So it moved now from the yeah from this from those, uh, the initial yeah high cost schools exactly, exactly. Which are now like the national now schools the national schools so it now and spread others. yeah so it was Damupevo that is to Damupevo was instrumental definitely in many ways. and if you look at the names involved <coughs> you will see that they are actually these are the, some of the rugby greats okay mm. yeah yes. name some mm. uh, Max Muniafu, Muniafu. Mm -hmm. Michael Tanko Tieno mm -hmm. Omega Ludeni mm -hmm. they they countless. City Muga. Mm. <laughs> yes. I was waiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And going back a bit, there is a tournament called the Enterprise Cup. Yeah. In, uh, uh, the history of the Enterprise Cup is uh, um, the, the HMS Enterprise, as you as you are told. Mm. Rugby came by ship. Yeah, mm. landed in Mombasa, <laughs> uh -huh. and there was a rugby match, and a cup was donated. Yeah. And uh, that's the cup that uh, whose names endures to to this day, and it's still the same same trophy, same trophy, same trophy, same trophy from the nineteen twenties. Yeah. Correct. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Mm. It's the time for you to wake up. <laughs> 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 okay, sevens. I see. Uh, let me just read a snippet from uh, from your book. Uh, the inaugural edition of the Safari Sevens tournament was in nineteen ninety six. The idea at the time of inauguration was that. It would offer a plausible alternative to the Hong Kong Sevens Tournament, which, as Hong Kong was then returning to Chinese rule after almost a century of British rule, did not seem like it would retain its status as a top international rugby sevens tournament. This is because the Chinese did not put, put much emphasis on the game of rugby, and in fact the sport did not even have a strong functioning league in the country. At least in within Hong Kong, there was a functional league through up, uh, made up though made up mostly of the expatriate community with a few of the locals sprinkled in to add a home-based flavor the idea was a sound one the tournament has flourished and the locals in Nairobi have taken to the game like bees to honey the gates are good and the rugby action entertaining it continues so 1996 is when the idea of the Safari 7 tournament was started yes why as Agri pointed out earlier this mm. this idea actually came from the rugby patron society uh specifically uh robin cahill uh dreamt of the idea mm. and uh you will see somewhere else in the book there's a report from uh ronald bukusi who was the first ceo of uh of kru mm. and ronald relates it pretty well and he says uh, he talks about this uh dinner at the international casino where we had south african uh, guests of the union and uh and robin comes along and moots this idea 
and everybody says, wonderful, this sounds great. And that was the, that, that was the genesis of, of Safari 7. So the patron society really must be commended for, for, the, for that. Otherwise, we, we wouldn't have had the, the Safari 7. Agree? Yeah, um, I think there isn't too much more to say about that. But um, uh, as you know, the, the Safari 7 then grew and uh, became the bedrock of, uh, of the players that eventually got into the Kenya 7s. Because of the Safari 7s, uh, Kenya was invited to, to Dubai in, uh, in the, when the HSBC, um, the, 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 the seventh circuit, the, the World Rugby 7 circuit uh, began, I think, in 1999. Mm -hmm. uh, Kenya would be invited to at least two tournaments uh, out of the six or seven and then three. And then eventually by about 2003, uh, 2003 they, they became a core a co-member of uh, of that sevens and uh, that that Kenya sevens team has uh, been the driver of uh, the spreading the popularity of the game mm. in in Kenya and has been the flagship uh, of rugby for Kenya uh, internationally as they go from city to city it's a, it's a very very good um, ambassador for the country because they play in 10 10 different cities in a space of six months mm. across the world mm. and across and the I continents. May, if I may mention this, I think our, the Kenyan spectator is the best known yep. and best <laughs> loved spectator globally Absolutely. of rugby. Mm. Yeah, in the NRB 7s. That's true. true. Yeah. Yes. 27 minutes to 8. Let's take a quick break. We have our guest this morning. Zach Holo is a former rugby player and is now an author. He says he's trying to be one. He is uh, an author. He's a published author. He has written this book. He has authored the book called A Hundred Plus Years of Rugby in Kenya, A Century of Pride. It's a very, very good book. Looks at the history of rugby, the development of rugby as a sport in the country and where we are at now. Agri Chabeda is an MD, Sports Options Limited. He is a former rugby player, a former rugby administrator, a rugby enthusiast no but he's a rugby aficionado he knows a lot about rugby and rugby and sports management in the country and the two gentlemen are here we're talking about this this is the situation room the only way to start your day i agree chaveta and zakolo rugby aficionados with us in the studio we're talking about 100 years plus of rugby in the republic of kenya there's a gentleman who's called duncan motonya he's riding a motorbike to the coast and he's listening to the situation room and of course because he's riding a bike he's not holding the phone to his ear he's using the samsung galaxy buds 2 pro to listen as he rides <laughs> see the use of these things mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. so he has his z flip phone uh, in the pocket it's of course connected to the internet the buds 2 pro and then he has a helmet on and he's listening. And he's listening. And he's on his motorbike. And he's on his motorbike as he's riding. It's not a wonderful and thing. And he's a GoPro, of course, camera. And he's capturing all the images as he's moving. You know, beauty of life. <laughs> this is about quality of life. Uh -huh. mm. So, you know, in the country, we talk about the highs and lows of various sports, whether it's hockey, it's rugby, it's football, it's athletics, it's uh, uh, which cricket. One? Cricket. That's the one. Of the volleyball. Ones. You know, even volleyball. And basketball. basketball. We have all those highs and lows, you know, it's a season which is called like the golden era. And then others which are now, you don't want to refer to them as anything, just want to forget about them. Of course, you have seen those ups and downs in Kenya's rugby. Which would you mention and what is it that led to, would say, led to the rise and what happened to lead to the lows? In my view, the, uh, the highest high Kenya rugby has been 2016 when the seventh team won the uh, Singapore leg mm. of the IRB sevens and uh, if you trace the history of sevens it goes back to an organization known as Watembezi Pace Setters RFC mm -hmm. who set off in the uh, early 80s led by one Cliff Mukulu Dennis Awori uh, to play sevens rugby in the Middle East and eventually did actually also represent Kenya in the Hong Kong sevens in 1986. So they were the, uh, they started off this trend and sevens picked up for various reasons, but particularly Kenyans, we, our style of rugby 
lent itself to sevens very well. Mm. We, we, we play high speed, yep. fancy rugby. <laughs> so, um, so we did very well. Mm. And uh, in the, uh, to the in the 2000, early 2000, we picked our game picked up, and we continued to develop our our, our style. And by 2016, we were able to win this. I mean, this is a world class, you know, tournament. Yep. That was won by Kenya. And I don't know how many people actually fully appreciate the magnitude of what we achieved. So that was the highest of the highs. Mm. But there's also the 15-a-side game mm. where you look back and you say, what happened? And, and it's amazing to, to think that in 1953, we played the British Lions mm -hmm. and only lost by a score of 35 to, to 3. That's incredible. <laughs> if we play the Lions today, <laughs> I don't know what you guys think. If we play the Lions today, it would be 150 to, <laughs> to three. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be in those regions. Yeah. 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 But again, looking so, back, so mm, one of the other highs is when we first beat Zimbabwe at the uh, 15 aside level, mm -hmm. which was in the early 80s. That was also one of the highs of the game. Mm. What are the lows, Zagre? Uh, <clears throat> For me, the laws are we various tournaments that uh, have um, come along that could have been the ones that are uh, uh, the the bread that is feeding Kenya rugby mm. have um, have gone wayward. Um, the peak one being the Safari Sevens. Um, I think the Safari Sevens at one time was 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 returning in excess of uh, a surplus of twenty million shillings. For a tournament that uh, was uh, one weekend, mm. and if it had continued at that level, this could have been way into hundreds of millions of shillings today, and that could have been the the the, the, the foundation on which the the union would sit and then look for more uh, sponsors. Mm. Uh, there was a 15th tournament also called uh, Rugby Super Series, mm. um, which used to be sponsored by Bamburi. Mm. Um, I chaired that incidentally for about uh, for 12 years. Again, it, it was growing steadily. Uh, it's no longer played. So, to me, these these these, these are unfortunate uh, event stands of events within the game. Um, but I think uh, there are, there are things that uh, should be looked at and uh, the mistakes and the reasons why these events have gone be be, be addressed and uh, they they are brought back. What um, what are the reasons in your perspective? Haha, <laughs> you want me to be political now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, no, I, I, I think um, just poor management. I think I can't, I can't say anything beyond that. They, they, they've, they've been mismanaged over time. They've uh, not the professionalism with which they were being run uh, was allowed to to slip through the fingers, and uh, and inevitably uh, they, they they lost their way. Mm. Yes. Let me ask this question. You see, there's a framework within which rugby exists. It's called sports. Do we have a, a legal framework within which a sports like rugby can actually be enhanced? Um, the, the, the sports in Kenya runs, they are essentially still back in the space where most of the sports are run through the associations, mm -hmm. which used to be set up through the the Societies Act, mm. um, but much later on, the government tried to, to 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 get involved because of a lot of clamor from from a lot of uh, directions that it's not being managed properly, and they created uh, uh, and put in place the Sports Act. Um, so how did that work out? So the sport mm. the Sports Act has worked in certain ways and has not worked in other ways. I think the biggest weakness with the Sports Act is. Uh, it was enacted uh, with very little um, uh, participation by the, the main stakeholders who, to me, were the sports federations themselves. Mm. Mm. So as a result, is uh, there is a lot of um, clauses in that where it's um, um, they, they, they look like they mean well, but they actually do not serve the game. Uh, if I can pick one specific one, um, in the Sports Act, they, there is an... There is a demand that every federation must have a branch or uh, whatever you want to call it in 24 out of 48. It's like a political party. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So the question is why? And uh, nobody asks the question and, and who, who funds all this? Mm -hmm. If I go and set up, 
in uh, Kitui. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is no rugby in Kitui, for example. Um, then officials pop out of Kitui. Uh, what's their role? Uh, mm -hmm. Other than to come and, and, and distort an el the election process, mm -hmm. right. which is exactly what is happening. And it's not just in rugby, even no. in other sports. So, in fact, what is happening is you are finding that the sports registrar is refusing to let um, some of the uh, federations hold their elections on the basis that they do not conform to the Sports Act. But when you go and analyze, it is just the elections that they haven't set up branches mm. in this yeah and it is distorting the leadership of these bodies yeah. and uh, it is something that needs to be addressed like yesterday isn't it true that i mean we spoke i mean I'm, again i'm going to look at rugby because obviously what we're discussing today yes but then it's going to cut across uh, the board that yes. can agree here because I, I i the way i see it is that until a spectacular talent is found really very little is done about the the the, the projected compacted conditional institutionalization of sports in this country until you find a rare gem is now when somebody starts running about and say okay let's do something about this right and that's when you start coming up with things like the sports act and now when you start saying associations must do one two three or the other thing when Yego threw his javelin and then everybody found out that he learned it on YouTube and whatever, whatever, that's when we said, oh, okay, maybe we can start doing something about this. Really? <laughs> um, if we want to compare with what happens in other countries, I'll take the NBA draft, for example. You find kids, I'll take Kobe Bryant. He was in high school where they were running basketball programs. The time a child is walking, they put a basketball in their hands. This is what's happening today. So by the time they get to 16, 17, they're drafted by the NBA. It's of no surprise to anybody that you will find such talent. But we seem to do things in, in the opposite here. Somebody will pop out of the woodwork and do something spectacular. And then we'll say, oh, fantastic. Let us now see what we can do with this thing. Oscar Osir can get a rugby ball in his hands and he can run like speed, Speedy Gonzalez. And we say, okay, fantastic. Let's now see how we can institutionalize this thing. Hadn't we, shouldn't we be doing it the other way around? The other way around. Yeah, I'd even go further than you and say, um, and with all due respect to our, 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 our government administrators, a lot of them meet our stars for the first time at the airport yeah. when, when, they are, when, 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 they're, when they're coming back <laughs> having won <laughs> something born. yeah then they they quickly make phone calls and uh, <laughs> they turn up to meet them and uh, and put them in their cvs later on or uh, they're, 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 they're saying the, we this year these are our successes mm. the performance, mm. uh, performance indicators yeah. exactly mm. right so and you're quite right um we need we need to do this at the developmental level at the at, at, at the primary school to me the primary schools are are the foundation um in in, in a country like kenya where the resources can be scarce which we accept there is one place where we have resources across the whole country it's primary schools mm. that's why we hold elections in primary schools mm. so there is there is there is a structure there is there is pitch mm. yeah so from there we need to invest in teachers to understand sports and uh and then equipment into those into those and get get the sport running at, the, at that add, level. If yeah. I may just add to that, and particularly with particular reference to to rugby, mm. I think it would be very unfair to expect the care you to be able to run developmental rugby. Absolutely, they do not just do not have the resources. Absolutely. This has to be done in conjunction with other parties. Mm -hmm. And those other parties may very well include the government. As Agri says, primary schools do not require very much to be able to play a game of rugby, mm -mm. apart from what they have today. Mm -hmm. And therefore, to a large extent, the initiative should, could come from somewhere, but the government has to be involved. Mm -hmm. And then we're looking at communities. How much do communities contribute to, to the game? And so the union's function really would be to reach out to the communities and say, look, let's get involved. Mm. Mm. If in the teacher training schools, as part of their, 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 their uh, training, um, it be compulsory that they must at least uh, train in some sport, whichever one that uh, takes their fancy, mm. so that you then have teachers getting into schools 
Yeah. All of them already with some knowledge people. in some yeah. spot. Yeah. 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 And Damupevu yeah. is a good example. Yes. Of yeah. And that won't what cost happened? the government too much. They already they are being paid salaries. Yep. And they find themselves in the schools. You know, and I'd, and these things I'll will take move it from further. There. Yeah. In this last week we've had passing out parades, national youth, mm. administration, police, police, GSU. Same. Yeah. Get these people involved in sports. Yeah. yeah. So one of the people who passed out in one of those parades was Omanyala himself, yes. who is uh, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> who, yes. who graduated, quote unquote, and mm. he's one of them. Yes. We also yeah. had three members of the Kenya rugby team. Mm. Yes. Mm. Passing out, yeah, passing out. Uh, mm. for the police. I, I think that mm. the involvement of government has to be a lot more than just a suggestion. Mm. Um, and so, I mean, I, I read a book, and it's conspiracy, of course, but many would argue that the United States made sure that across board they had people sporting programs. Many would say that they did this so that it's kind of like how they also invented Hollywood so that they could take people's attention away from what they were really doing in government. Okay, but somehow it seemed to work. Right? So that from the very youngest of ages, like you're saying, people took it seriously. So I think it's more than a suggestion of maybe you can get involved. I think it is a role that government has to play. Has to play because mm. you cannot have all your attention on just the academic. Mm. It cannot be just on the business. There is a wealth of opportunity that lies in this thing that we are talking about. And can I flip the coin then in this conversation? We've heard government you know, coming out to say, okay, so we'd like to see a better organized cricket, better organized hockey, better organized rugby. But where does the pushback come from? It comes from the officials in those federations. It comes not even from the players. It is from the people who are officials in those federations. Why is it so? Why do you see that, I agree? I mean, even today, I'm sure uh, Ababu Namwamba, the sports CS, will tell you, and those people, he, he'll tell you, the people that are found in this ministry have documents, have had meetings, have had these plans, have had this, you know, prog programs. The government, the initial government of Jubilee, the current government of uh, Kenya Kwanzaa, they've all talked about sports, but it doesn't seem to move. Pushback? Federations. Yeah, I mean, federations, at the end of the day, um, a federation is as strong as its membership. Um, and if we can strengthen the game at the grassroots in the long term it's not something that will happen in a year or two years in the long term once you have a lot of people who are playing the game they will form clubs they will form associations they will push through the right people to govern them and uh but for as long as that side of the the the, the, the federations are weak um we, we 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 try and force situations at the top that are really not possible because it's the federations independent federations individual federations that are that that govern the sport mm. um, and that's the way it should be and that's how it happens everywhere else in the world and they are successful in many other places in the world there are others who are not so successful so we have to borrow from from where it's successful and uh, the fact is if if the if the foundation is strong mm. eventually the federation will be strong what's the place of the global sports bodies if it's in the, the uh, what's it called the the athletics one now the, the Sebastian Coe one is called the rugby one is called World Rugby the World Rugby yes um, IWF. IWF, IWF, IWF right? is now called World Athletics yeah, World Athletics that's the one yes. I'm looking World for athletics. you know yes. uh, FIFA yes what's what's role do they play in this thing that we're talking about helping the local federations and also having that encouraging the local governments to be able to get more people playing yeah i think it um it depends but generally speaking the models of most of them are very similar they appoint a body within the country to be the one that is uh, empowered to govern the game within that country that happens with fifa that happens with world rugby that happens with world athletics and um they then encourage that body to 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 come up with some developmental program and uh they tend to send funds pumping a lot and, of and, money and, and very often the funds they send they send uh are geared towards the developmental part of, their, the, of yeah. the game I'd, I'd be they send to the federation yeah. because that is the body which uh, they are they affiliate with 
Okay, they generally that's what they do. Mm. FIFA, of course, because it has a lot of money, does have a lot of extra money to send to do other things, like they've sent money to Kenya for FKF to have mm. to build offices. Mm. Yeah. Um, but those are those are not very common in a lot of the other federations because sometimes they don't have those sort of funds. Go ahead. I Zach. don't know what you think, Zach. No, no, I was, just, I was just going to say that I'd be very careful about saying they send a lot of money. I don't think they send a lot of money, particularly uh, when it comes to rugby. There's There's been an ongoing um, manenos about uh, how the world rugby treats the various tiers of, of uh, rugby nations. Mm. So, so Kenya being second or third tier, being third tier, third tier. barely gets anything mm. from, from, from world rugby. Yeah, from world rugby. By barely, I mean it probably doesn't come up to 50 million shillings a year. Whereas the tier one nations get millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, that's something that's been going on for a while. So there's a bit of a showery about it, but, but there's not enough muscle among the third tier nations mm. to, to push this agenda very hard. How do you acquire muscle? Muscle they probably acquired through numbers. And, and in this case, numbers. the numbers are how many people play rugby in your country, yeah. mm. how many countries are in the third tier. Yeah. When, we have a, when we have a world rugby uh, seminar, whatever, do they show up to push their cause? Mm. So all those things. As we conclude the conversation, there's a question that has been asked by the Kush. He's saying, so all these years, 100 years plus of rugby, we have um, X years of football, X years of athletics. We don't have a sports museum in the country. Yes, um, that is true. And uh, it's most unfortunate. Mm. In terms of rugby, actually, it's very interesting because nondescripts RFC actually do have a museum. And yes. this is a very, very commendable. They actually and launched you, it yeah, in November. Yeah, it was launched in November. Yes. And I understand the official launch is actually ne this year. Oh, okay. Mm. Because this year they, they actually get to, to be 100 rather than last year. Mm. Yes. So we, we expect to see uh, a lot from them. And that, that should be an example for everybody else. But, but you're quite right. There's mm. no sports museum. And, and that, you know, would help in telling the story mm. of how we've developed to call ourselves a nation of champions in all ways than one. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today. Hikitabu itanaza nunuwa wapi, Zach? Hikitabu itanunulewa. It's going to be in the bookshops by the 9th of uh, February. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a launch, uh, hopefully a very big launch. We have invited uh, serious VIPs, including former, former rugby players. Mm. We hope they'll, they'll, they'll show up on that day. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank Zach Olo is an author. He has authored 100 plus years of rugby in Kenya. Like he said, it'll be in the bookshops in coming weeks. And Agri Chabeda is a sports administrator and a sp uh, of sports aficionado. He is now the MD of Sports Options Limited. Keep it here for more conversations.